How far can the gear from Calamity 1.0 hold up against the modern day Calamity mod? That's the question I've always wondered. Does Zero Gear, along with Calamity's first ever blade, hold up against the evolved Devour of Gods? How far can items made 8 years ago take me in today's version of Calamity? In this video, we will 100% this version in its entirety, so stick to the end to find out. Okay, so some background information before we get started. What I'm currently playing on is version 1.0 of Calamity. You notice my rage and adrenaline meters are completely gone. My fight bar, also gone. There isn't even any difficulty game modes. Heck, for the full experience, why don't we just remove all the texture packs? Ah, <laughs> okay. This is bringing me back to the good old days. Anyways, like I said, this also works with the current version of Calamity, but I won't be enabling it right now, so I could fully experience 1.0 for myself. With some trees cut down, I make a set of wood armor. And to the left that I spawn is the corruption. So without proper gear, there's nothing for me to do but to retreat and explore the other side. I found some living wood trees, give me an aglet, and a wand of sparking from the other chest. It's so crazy that traces of Draydon are nowhere to be seen in this version, as the cute little Wolfram bots that I'm so used to are just non-existent. I eventually make my way to the desert biome, and the vulture drops a desert feather. Putting this into my recipe browser, we can see this recolored Avenger emblem, which is the spawner for the very first boss in Calamity. Further away, I reach the edge of the desert, and something pretty lucky happens here. The Devour Worm spawned and chased me, which revealed a buried desert pyramid underneath the ground, which I never would have spotted otherwise. So I mined down and got myself the beautiful sandstorm in a bottle, providing me with a great double jump. As I venture further and further down, I loot a desert cabin, giving me a bar statue and the thunder zapper, a pretty decent mage weapon, but I don't really have the mana to use it right now. After dying to a tomb crawler, I respawn and notice the sun is setting once again, so I construct myself a nice little box, do some inventory sorting, and spend most of the night mining a elevator. After not much success of finding a good cave to explore, I recall up and revisit the underground pyramids. I find myself two life crystals, and moving away from the granite biome, I reach the blue mushroom biome. And from the chest, I really didn't get anything useful. But hey, the vanity set looks pretty nice, so that's what I'm using. After some time, I slowly approach hell, and the gold chest gave me the lava charm. And with that, I dropped down into the obsidian towers. But with only a couple pickaxe, I couldn't really do anything here. So I recall back to base, and make the essential crafting stations. I made an amethyst hook, and with a small amount of platinum, I made a platinum pickaxe, which will allow me to mine obsidian, which believe it or not, is a pretty crucial ingredient within 1.0. And the game plan now, fighting the first ever iteration of the Desert Scourge. This is going to be interesting. So I make myself the Desert Medallion, and head over to the Desert Biome, where I built a row of platforms, and place the campfire for some extra regeneration. And it's time to fight the Desert Scourge. One thing I immediately notice is how incredibly slow and skinny the boss is. Like, I don't even have Hermes boots on me, but I can still very comfortably just run backwards and be fine from its quote unquote head charge. I completely annihilate this boss fairly easily. And yeah, I guess that's our first boss down. From the treasure bag, you're not going to be happy. I got no weapons, no accessories, only some seashells, starfish, and coral, which can all be obtained from the beach anyways. But we did get some victory shards, allowing us to make either the star fury or craft some victide armor back at base. I only had enough ingredients to make 7 bars, so I crafted myself the red tide sword. Throughout the video, I'll be showing you old versus new comparisons of each weapon, 8 years apart from each other. And man, for my first ever Calamity weapon, I was pretty disappointed. So to craft all the Calamity gear available to me, I head back to the desert to collect some more materials. And since it's becoming night time, I spent the rest of the day building some NPC housing. And with the morning soon approaching, I head back to the desert biome and refight the desert scourge. I don't know why, but it's just so funny seeing how far we've come from the early days. Like, this would definitely not slide in today's modern standards. But anyways, with another Desert Scourge defeated, I still do not have enough ingredients to make a full set. Like, I know I keep comparing the two versions, but like, today's Calamity, after one boss fight, you'd have enough to craft everything. The armor sets, the weapons. In this version, I gotta fight this meme worm another three times to get anything. Inflation is definitely real. And you'll notice this trend throughout the rest of the playthrough. This time, I tested my Red Tide Sword, and I mean, with all that work, I can now craft a full set of Victide armor. This is the armor set bonus today, with a helmet for each class, literally a mini essay. And this is what we have in version 1.0, increases life regen and damage while submerged in liquid. Pretty simple enough. 
I also crafted the C bow, which deals a little more base damage, but fires a lot faster than a typical platinum bow. So to test my new equipment, I do a little arena preparations for the Eye of Cthulhu. I flattened the sand mounds, slightly extended the arena outwards, and let the fight begin. I mainly used my wooden arrows with the C bow for the entire fight, and it actually performed decently well. The rapid fire rate from the bow made keeping up with the eye servants a little bit easier. And with the eye's defeat, I equipped the most important accessory in the Shield of Cthulhu dash, and craft some demon eye bars, which I would ultimately make into the Light's Bane. This is definitely an upgrade to my Red Tide Sword, and now I head down into the Corruption Chasms. My first orb gave me the musket. It's decent, but nowhere near as good as my Red Tide Bow. But the second orb gave me the Vile Thorn, which has insanely good pierce and pretty underrated. And the final orb, which gave me some duplicates. And I didn't really try to defeat the Eater of Worlds. As I soon found out, Aerolite was another set I could craft. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but when this version of Calamity was out, Aerolite was locked as a post-evil boss, as you needed a stronger pickaxe to mine obsidian. But now, the materials to craft Aerolite bars were actually possible pre-bosses. I spent today doing some underground exploration, grabbing some chests, life crystals, and mining a ton of obsidian. I then could craft some diamond dust and rope up towards the sky islands for the last few materials. I needed some feathers, clouds, rain clouds, sky mules, and sun plates. To the left, nothing. And it's kind of funny seeing how empty Calamity feels without the giant planetoids and little meteorites in the sky to give you loot. They definitely help to speed up progression in the early game. But with the lack of bosses in this version, I guess it kind of makes sense. To the right side, I eventually run into a sky island and got myself the lucky horseshoe from the chest and spent the rest of the night mining sun plate blocks for the sky meal, clouds for my aerospec equipment and killing the occasional harpy for some feathers. What was absurd was that a giant harpy feather actually dropped from one of the harpies which is quite a rare find but obviously without souls of flight I couldn't really make any sort of wings. Or could I? From my first haul I made a sky meal and then combined diamond dust with clouds to make some aerolite bars. I got 36 total from this, allowing me to make a full set of aerospec armor. What a cool set bonus I will get. A Valkyrie minion, maybe some extra feathers on attacks. Nope, just increases movement speed as health decreases. Seems pretty useless to me, but I used it anyways. I still needed some extra materials, so I could try out all the aerospec gear. So I spent another day farming up within the Sky Islands. And with that, I made the Gale Force. This does not have any special effects as opposed to the current version, but at least it shoots faster. And the Wind Blade, well, it didn't do much either. Now, I know you might think I'm disappointed, but that's what I kind of expected from the very first version. What I did not expect was how broken the Skyline Wings were going to be. You can't remember, in 2016 pre-hard mode, Wings such as fledging did not exist, so this was a first of its kind, and my gosh, was the mobility on these things so good. And with all the newly acquired equipment, I came back to the corruption for the rematch against the Eater of Worlds. With the Gale Force paired with just the arrows, I completely shred the Eater of Worlds. And without Calamity's anti-cheat web protection, it got decimated fairly quickly. The Wind Blade was just kind of decent I guess but I'm pretty sure a Blade of Grass or Light's Bane would be even faster. So that's another boss down, and we're one step closer to fighting the Slime God. Since Calamity has not nerfed the Worm Scarf in this version, I was quick to equip this accessory, giving me a very nice 17% damage reduction. And with the Knight still pretty young, I purchased a bunch of arrows and head over to the dungeon. On the way, I made sure to mine up some ice so I could craft some Frostburn arrows. And since I'm feeling super strong right now, I just go ahead and immediately challenge Skeletron. As I mentioned, with Aerolite wings I crafted, these provided me with some insane movement. Skeletron could not keep up, and I was easily just able to circle it. That was another boss down. And now we begin our journey into the dungeon. In the latest version of Calamity, we would now explore the spooky abyss biome, as abyssal treasures have been unlocked. But for 1.0, a water bolt was pretty nice. I also collected some bones, water candles, gold keys, and soon I end up noobishly dying, tricking a goblin army to invade my base. Usually, this would be somewhat of a struggle, as I aim to fight this invasion pretty early on into my playthroughs. But with the Gale Force bow and water bolt for piercing, it was a fairly quick battle. After the invasion, I made myself an Aerolite Hammax and used this tool to chop down some trees and expanded my storage capacity. And speaking of expansions, I did the same thing with my NPC prison. Now begins my proper elevator. Whilst I'm here, I go ahead and collect some Hellstone ore. 
as this will be quite useful for status gel later on. And I'm not sure if it was just me, but this armor set seemed extremely broken. Just wait and see. I go ahead and gather some materials to summon the slime god, such as rubies, and on the way, I actually ran into the bound goblin tinkerer, which was a huge power boost for us, as we get to combine some accessories together. I also made a start to my pylons, by creating additional housing at the snow biome, and pairing the goblin and mechanic together. And while I'm here, let's also gather a bunch of ice, to make some frostburn arrows. Now before we fight slime god, I had to defeat king slime first, like 3 of them total, just so I had enough gel to make the overloaded sludge. In this version, it costs 100 gel for a consumable slime god sum. In the current version, it is 40 blighted gel for infinite attempts. So as I beat my personal best over and over again, I got a bunch of random goodies, and more importantly, 126 gel total. So I barely had enough to make another slime crown, and use the rest of the gel on the slime god summon. I just get one shot at slime god, so I better make this count. I construct a pretty basic arena, expanding my wooden platforms on top of my base, and topping it off with some campfires. Since it was already kind of dark, I wanted the viewing experience to be as best as possible, so I waited until daytime to fight the boss. But in the meantime, I just constructed more NPC houses at the desert biome, and also at the jungle biome. It's now the next morning, and we begin our slime god showdown. Yes, this is what it looks like in 1.0. Not two slime gods and a slime god core, just one singular slime. It was quite easy, with my great piercing water bolt, but something extremely frustrating was in the true slime god form in the second phase, it despawned when I got too far away. The first phase of the fight was extremely long, so this made me pretty upset. I decided to do a bit more powering up within the jungle bite. The caustic edge was a weapon I was interested in, as it has pretty high base damage and gives sick. Whatever that means. I also ran into the jungle temple, so that's a nice plus for later down the line. After a while in collecting jungle spores, stingers, and vines, I ended the night off by collecting some fallen stars, so I could top off my mana bar. I made sure on the way to collect some meteorite, which will prove to be useful later on. Eventually, I made it all the way to the dungeon and used my spare keys I had to open a gold chest, giving me the Muramasa. And of course, I freed the mechanic because for some reason, I could not find her at all when I first explored the dungeon. It's now the next morning and we have some crafting to do. I first made my hellstone bars, which I would then turn into the volcano, which then I would ultimately craft into the night's edge. Then I made myself some media armor and the space gun. These will all be nice to have for my rematch against Slime God, as with media armor, I had even more mana and magic damage to use my water bowl. There's nothing much for me to say about the first phase of the fight. It's extremely long. But in phase 2, I made sure to stay as close as possible. I refuse to let this boss despawn. So abusing Slime AI, I basically got it stuck underneath my NPC housing, and mowed it down for an easily victory royale. From the loot we got, I was surprised to see gel darts as our first pre-rogue weapon. Within this version though, there was no rogue class, so similar to vanilla items, it was tagged as range damage, but still functions pretty similar to what we have today. And also with purified gel being dropped, I can now make myself the Sada gel armor set. This set, this set right here, is probably the most unbalanced thing in the whole game. We know in the current version, it's a 5 helmet armor set with a focus on mobility and survivability. But in this version, I'm not sure if it was a bug, a mod clash, or something of that kind, but it provides us with a 1000% summoner damage boost. In game, all it states is that it grants minion damage, throwing crit, and speed boost as HP gets lower. Simple enough, right? Okay, let's make an imp staff to pair with this set bonus, and I'm getting 189 summon damage. Like what the? Even from the early days of Calamity, it still remains perfectly balanced in some ways. You might be thinking, there's no way Mura's gonna use for the entire run, right? Surely not. Well, you just gonna have to watch and see. With Slime God defeated, and all of Calamity's main pre-hard mode items obtained, there's nothing much else but for me to challenge the Wall of Flesh. So I got to work building a short little runway in Hell, and once it was long enough, I went further out to see if maybe there was a glimpse of a Jadon lab anywhere in the world. But nah, they don't exist yet. I eventually made my way to the depths of the underground jungle, and spotted a beehive. This is the perfect opportunity for me to showcase the perfectly balanced Satagel armor.
After that was taken care of, I placed down a water candle and wait for a voodoo demon to spawn. It's so weird how insanely buffed the spawn rates of these things are in the current version of Calamity. But without it, it actually took a while for one to spawn. 6 minutes and 8 seconds to be precise for one voodoo doll. So we better first try this thing. So before the fight, let's get ourselves to 300 HP. And now it's time for the wall of flesh. There wasn't any real strategy to this fight. Just try your best to dodge the lasers by moving up and down. And obviously, I abused the hell out of the Imp Staff due to how great its piercing was. Like, looking back at the footage, the damage from the Imp Staff is absolutely absurd. And yeah, after a while, blah blah blah, summoner always OP, and I eventually kill it. So fast, in fact, I didn't even need my runway that I built. On to hard mode. Firstly, I destroy a bunch of demon altars to get some hard mode ores to spawn. And similar to vanilla, I rush through all the lower tier ores so I could mine some cobalt, crafting a cobalt pickaxe to mine some orichalcum, and make an orichalcum pickaxe to mine up some titanium ore. Now, unlike the current version of Calamity, where hard mode progression is super flexible, in version 1.0, this is pretty streamlined. Your first set is the Daedalus Armor, crafted with a bunch of ice theme ingredients. Like I hinted at before, the insane amount of grinding needed to craft a full set is ridiculous, as 10 minutes of pixie farming only gave me enough ingredients for 8 bars of versatility. So I decided to check out all the possible weapons I could make, and went for a safe bet in the Dark Echo Great Bow. But yeah, this weapon is pretty trash, so I decided just to stick to my summoner game plan. I realized even though I was on 1.0, Sanguine Bats and Whips were still up for grabs. So that was my next game plan to powering up through the tough early phase of hard mode. So I first shimmed my Warrior Emblem to a Summoner Emblem, further stacking my Satagel Armor Set, and with this, I did a little bit of limit testing. And as I was getting some buffs for the Twins fight, a Blood Moon decided to spawn in. And that was perfect timing, as I now have a chance to get the Sanguine Staff. I made my way above the Ice Biome, and built a nice little safety box above. I can confidently say I was pretty underprepared for this blood moon, and it definitely showed when I fished up a dread nautilus, which I stood no chance against. All the flying projectiles dealt so much damage, and I died a bunch of times thereafter. At the end of the night, I got absolutely nothing, but a bloody tig did give me an option to force another blood moon on the next night. But as for the today, I went to the right side of my ocean and got to work preparing the ultimate blood moon fishing box. And once again, it went pretty bad. I ended the night with what seemed like every single special Blood Moon mob, except for the Dread Nautilus. So whilst I let another day go by, I restock on my enchanted Nightcrawlers, and expanded my wooden platform further. Now, the next sequence you're about to see is pretty insane. And as I was sleeping to speed up the next day cycle, the air around me was getting cold, meaning a mech boss was fast approaching. And on my first fish, I actually got a Dread Nautilus to spawn, so I quickly had to kill it. Thankfully, Satagel armor with my Imp Staff is super OP, and I was able to chill in my box with all these regeneration bobs. And luckily, on my first kill, I managed to snag myself the Sanguine Staff. You know these minions as one of Summoner's most essential weapons, with a great amount of damage and great tracking as well, being able to float above the player and focus nearby enemies. Unlike other minions such as my Imp Staff, which always seem to miss fast bosses. You can imagine with a super glass cannon build, I had to heavily rely on my dodging abilities, as a stray laser could easily half my HP in a single blast. I wasn't planning to fight the mechs at the moment, but I might as well start now since I got my main weapon and the knight is still young. So I quickly teleport back to base and use my much bigger arena to fight the twins. Similar to Skeletron Prime, getting close to the boss is a no-go. So standing back and letting my Sanguine Bats do all the work was what had to be done. With my insane summoner bobs from the Satagel armor, you could theoretically use this armor set for the entirety of the run. But for the sake of a more entertaining video, I'll use all the other equipment in progression that's coming up. As you can see, big damage doesn't always equal a victory royale. So I'm now 0-2 against the twins, so I open up my Skeletron treasure bag, giving me some hallowed bars, which I would then turn into the Durandor whip. Yes, whips did not exist back when Calamity was released, but 625 summon damage? Yeah, I'd win. The Blood Moon was going to be ending soon however, so instead of rushing, I first head back to the Underground Hallow for some key ingredients, and do the same thing in the Underground Corruption Biome. With these, I made myself another Mechanical Eye and the Mechanical Worm. And now, I expand my Ocean Arena once more, reaching all the way to the edge. This time, I also brought some basic buffs, and one last quick reforge on my whip. 
With my current build, I'm quite literally made out of glass, meaning I would easily get one shot by any head charge. But my damage output is absolutely absurd. I wish I had a DPS meter here. Yeah, summon a balance as usual. And with the destroyer out of the way, now it's the twins. They stood no chance at all. So with every mechanical boss now being defeated, I can finally make myself the particle accelerator, giving me access to more OG Calamity content. And in the spirit of trying something new, we're going to be switching over to Reva equipment. And guess what? They're crafted with Draydon bars. Ooh, wow. Wait, Draydon so cool. Draydon like the Exomex? This requires a lot of sky themed ingredients, such as Ancient Feathers, Essence of Cinder, and after a while, I got kinda bored, so I made even more NPC housing and headed to the jungle to farm up some Living Dew droplets, which are another component to the Reaver set. And with 35 Draydon bars being crafted, I could afford a full set. We know in the current version, Reaver is a utility based set with various different helmets, but in 1.0, it grants various melee stats scaling as your HP gets lower. I didn't really have a strong melee weapon as of right now, so the Excalibur will have to do whilst I build up the components for the Terror to me. And you'll see later in this video, this is my absolute favourite weapon. So that's the end of my overpowered summoner arc. But I still use my summoner set to farm some mobs, because I'm lazy. And with more Draydon bars, I could also make some of the weapons, such as the Feral Thorn Claymore, which in version 2.0.3, it is now a true melee weapon that upon hitting an enemy will spawn two pillars of thorns that do not pierce. But the weapon I have now when it was first released fires a singular thorn, but the range of the projectile can be pretty small. Wait, 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 what am I talking about? It is massive. And spent the rest of the day gathering some essential accessories, such as the Fire Gauntlet, Berserker Glove, Terra Spark Boots, and before we fight Plantera, I do a last pit stop in the jungle to collect some Chlorify. And I might as well make the Hellkite too. This tooltip states it contains the power of an ancient dragon. Is this a hint at Yaren maybe? We are pretty much as strong as we could be up to Plantera, but before we fight her, I wanted to test my power against the more weaker boss. And for my test subject, I choose Queen Slime. We can see the main drawback of the Claymore is how short range it is, and requires me to take some risk in order to do damage. I quite like this playstyle, and the Reaver set I have on also helps me recover from any fatal mistakes. I did not really struggle at all, which gave me a good indicator on how much I can limit test against Plantera. And let me first start off by saying, ever since I defeated Calamity's Get Fixed Boy version of Plantera, this version of her just seems so easy. In her first phase, I performed a basically circular motion and even though I got hit multiple times, the sheer amount of tankiness from my build is great. And after a while, I was able to make it onto phase 2. Now, she can actually hurt in this phase, so I gotta be somewhat careful. This meant I had to stay further back and let her ram into my thorns. It also helps that this weapon pierces, so you made dealing with her tentacles that much easier. After its defeat, we unlock something known as Living Shards. These can be obtained with other materials to craft Kropix bars and make the Araxia set. And we can also go further with this by combining the previous Daedalus bars, Draydon bars, and the newly obtainable Kropix bars to make bars of light. But a little more on these later. Since we're going to be fighting some really tough enemies within the dungeon, I'm back to the jungle to collect some Chlorify, and I head to Hell to collect some more Essence of Chaos. After that light grind session, I first make 8 Chaos Serpent Shards to make 32 Kropix bars, which isn't exactly enough to make a full armor set. So I craft myself a Plantera's Fruit and killed Plantera once more. And that puts me at 44 Kropix bars, meaning I have enough to make a brand new Calamity armor set. If you haven't noticed already, this is actually the Hydrothermic set, but in this version, it is Mage Focus, as opposed to the multi-class helmets that we're used to. So we'll be clearing out the dungeon for some ectoplasm as well as some really great mage weapons. In the first couple of minutes, I did collect the magnet sphere, but that was really it for my first trip in the dungeon. Nothing else was really that important, so we'll empty out our inventory and we're back for another trip. A few minutes later, I finally got the Shadow Bolt staff, and this made farming in larger groups of enemies so much easier. 
I took a little break from the dungeon farming and instead continued with the grind or farming essence, which would be much needed for future item crafts. With 26 cropping bars right now, I craft Discordian wings. Along with Discordian wings, I make myself the Hellfire Hambrosh. This looks exactly like a sword, but is actually a melee weapon in today's Calamity mod. But here, it is a mage weapon that spews lava on every swing. This is pretty decent I guess, but we are going to need much stronger weapons if you want to stand a chance against Moon Lord. And the weapon that caught my eye the most was the Terror to me. We know this weapon has went through a significant rework in the recent era of Calamity, and within this version, requires basically every single Calamity sword in the game. Kinda similar to the Zenith and its crafting tree. So for the next few days, I made myself the naughty present, planted some pumpkins so I could eventually craft the pumpkin moon medallion, and raided the golem temple for a solar tablet. Since it was daytime, I started off with the solar eclipse. The only thing I'm really after is the broken hero sword. And well, on my first Mothron attempt, we got that pretty easily. That solves our Terror Blade component, so next up is the Golem. This is a piss easy boss. So here's a quick compilation of all my Golem kills. All of that gives us 31 energy orbs, and their main function is to make Tarragon armor. All I got from the in-game description was that it grants multiple defense boosts if your health gets low. And I've also noticed it boosts our max HP. Here is my current stat sheet, and I'm sure there are more details to this, but just know it has the same premise as the current Tarragon armor set. It is tanky as opposed to celestial armor sets, which are focused on damage. Also, I'm not too sure why you wouldn't use beetle armor, because it just seems flat out better, but I'ma just pretend they don't exist. And apart from the other Eurobloom options, one item I was eager to craft was the Gamma Fusillade. That requires 50 souls of might in its recipe, so I sleep through the rest of the day until it becomes night time. Then I go ahead and kill a bunch of destroyers. And with my Tarragon armor set, I was surprisingly able to face tank the entire destroyer fight, without any issues at all. And with a bunch of souls collected, I now head up into space so I can craft some ancient feathers, the jungle biome for some living dew shards, and finally the tundra biome for some essence of Elian. There was some more grinding for other materials, but I can't be bothered showing you everything. With Cropic Spars, Dreydon Bars, and Versalite Bars, we can combine these all together to make the Bar of Life. These are basically the life alloys in regular version of Calamity, and gives us some pretty great weapon choices. And of course, we cannot forget about Cause of Calamity. And with that, I made myself the Gamma Fusilite and Blade of Emony. The mage weapon functions pretty similar, but it has slightly different and pretty E-Rape EV effects. It fires a stream of high velocity projectiles that deal a ton of damage. And the Blade of Emony. I was actually super excited to see this weapon, only for it to be a true melee weapon, with nothing special about it at all. So I decided another weapon that was available at this tier was the Life Hunt Scythe. This weapon fires miniature scythes that heal the player when it damages an enemy, which is a nice alternative to the grind of the Vampire Knives. Whilst I'm at it, my final weapon for now was the Terror Blade, but I didn't end up using it a whole lot so I could truly experience this old ass Calamity weapon. All that's left to do was clear the remaining invasions. We are pretty strong right now, and with the Gamma Fusilade, I was easily able to melt down all the mobs. That is, except for the pumpkins, which actually require me to use some brain power. My first kill dropped the Raven Staff, and since it was a summoner weapon, I might as well abuse this with the Satagel armor, so I could speed up the invasion a bit more. Nothing else for much for me to say, so let's just fast forward to the Frost Moon. One small change I made was using the Morningstar Whip, just to speed clear everything so we could get to the later waves pretty fast. And let's just say, even though the Stratagel was pretty hard mode tier, it is still strong hours and hours later into my playthrough. I didn't need anything from this event, so I cancelled it early and began my trek to the dungeon. It's Lunatic Cultist time. For consistent damage, I utilized my Gamma Tome for its insane DPS and easy tracking to melt the boss down. The only really tricky part about the Cultist is making sure you don't hit the wrong clone, and you can easily tell by the yellow markings on his hood. But if I'm being really honest, it didn't matter that much. Since I had Tarragon armor, I could basically use any weapon I wanted and be absolutely brain dead with my dodging. Yeah, this is sure some perfectly balanced gameplay. And in addition to the cultists dropping the Ancient Manipulator, we also got Meld Blobs. Which if we're talking about the current version of Calamity, this will be used for Lunar tier Rogue equipment. But in this version, it is used to make some of the strongest gear in the game. 
we don't have quite enough for everything, so obviously we're making the terror to me first. This does require some final blades to be crafted in the Zera Greatsword, which will require me to head to the dungeon and kill a Rage Caster for the Spectre Star. Then combine these together at the Particle Accelerator, and this Greatsword, this melee weapon, is what I'm used to. A blade that shoots random projectiles. Then we go to the Snow Biome and do a bit of killing. Mining ice, getting the ice machine, mining more ice, and oh my god, it requires 750 blocks of ice. Like what? And our final blade is the Marina, which requires us to go to the beach and mine up some coral and starfish. And after that, we got the Holy Grail of Swords. The Zenith, before the Zenith was actually in the game. The ultimate terror to me blade. This function basically identically for the entirety of this weapon has been in the game for. So there's still some powering up we can do, such as crafting the Frozen Shield for some insane synergy with my Tarragon armor, and do a bit of reforging. Man, I miss Calamity's current reforge system. Anyways, time for the first pillar, which will be Nebula. Mainly because these will drop meld blobs, which we can use to craft Zerak armor. In the end, we got 210, which will be plenty to make all that we need. But since we're turning these into meld bars, I head to the jungle to collect some more chlorophyte. And with 75 bars total, I first make the Zerak set. Imbued with Rage and Wrath as HP decreases. This set is an absolute beast. I never knew the name Xerox was this old in Calamity. And for anyone with more knowledge than me, what was Xerox in version 1.0? But anyways, let's test my might against Duke Fishron. The main reason for this boss is to get the Razor Blade Typhoon, which is a core cool ingredient in making the Nuclear Fury. Possibly the strongest mage weapon in this version of Calamity. The fight itself can usually be pretty difficult, but with the homing capabilities of the Teratomy, I didn't really struggle with DPS, and killed him quickly before the sun slowly sets. Sadly, I didn't get the Razor Blade Typhoon, so I had to sell everything and spend my entire life savings on treasure bags. And finally, I can make the Nuclear Fury. It functions pretty similar to what we have today, minus the new and improved VFX. And fun fact, this weapon can also be found in Thorium mod, as a Patreon item for Fabsul, which is the original creator of Calamity that we're playing right now. With that being said, there's nothing much for me to do in terms of progression, so let's destroy all the pillars and begin the Moonlord fight. Beginning with Stardust, this is the easiest pillar. Solar, I pretty much stayed underground with the Nuclear Fury to destroy everything. A super nice weapon. And Vortex wasn't much different, just Nuclear Fury spam. And with the last pillar being destroyed, I teleport to my ocean biome and await for Mood Lord to spawn. I'll be using the Terror to me as my main form of damage against the eyes and heads, as it allows me to stay further away without needing me to aim as much. My secondary weapons consisted of the Nuclear Fury and Stardust Dragon, just for some extra damage. Just remember, I'm using a multi-class set in the Xerog armor, so this allowed me to get some insane damage numbers. After a bit of time, I managed to kill its right hand, and very shortly after, its left hand. You would want to ideally take all three of its parts at the same time, to minimize the amount of time the true Cthulhu's could be firing at you. The miniature lasers are nothing to scoff at, and it was a fairly challenging battle, but we still have so many bosses left in this run. Now we are post Moon Lord, and we have one final boss to 100% this version of 1.0 Calamity, and enter our final endgame challenge. So now, I'm going to be doing some preparations to get stronger gear. I first head over to the oasis and convert some of the sand into hallow, which will allow me to farm up some light shards. And then, I just did the same thing on the other side for dark shards. And as I was farming, a Martian scout actually spawned in, so I might as well use this time to get the influx waiver as well. Though the Martians won't actually spawn until I return to base. And as I was farming some more shards, my Teratomy projectiles seemed to have triggered the cultist fight. So I had to quit and reload my world, which meant it was time to fight some aliens. Normally without a specialized arena, the Martian invasions can be quite difficult. Though with the Nuclear Fury and Xerox T equipment, I could easily just delete everything in my path. Even the Martian sources were no match for me. With my battle cry active, 
The invasion went pretty quickly, so I head back to the desert shard farming spot and triggered another Martian invasion, and this time, I was successful in obtaining the influx waiver. And since it was still night time, I mailed one last devourer for some souls of might, and with all the ingredients obtained, I craft myself the Galactica Blade. According to the official wiki, this weapon right here was actually the first ever weapon created in Calamity. And in this version in particular, it shoots a bunch of stars that release from the blade, as opposed to the current version which rains down Galactica comments from the sky. This weapon was by far the strongest weapon in the game. The last thing I have to do now is to fight the actual Devourer of Gods. Right here, I have the Cosmic Worm. And as I was trying to spawn it in, yeah, it didn't actually work at all. I was spam clicking, right clicking, spawning at different areas. I could not actually spawn it in normal. So I made the executive decision to use some cheats. Yeah, yeah, I know, but only to spawn the boss. So let's go with our very first attempt at the Devourer of Gods. Remember, this is what we can have today. And this is what we have 8 years ago. Yeah, not as epic as you might have thought, but here's the full fight for you guys anyway. Enjoy! Now there was a pretty funny highlight of the fight, which I had no idea about, where the Devourer of Gods actually freezes me into place, and I literally couldn't do anything about it. Luckily for me though, the probes only dealt 1 damage, but the head charge was 200 plus damage. I was literally just matching my buttons until I was finally freed with around 50 HP. And yeah, I'm the best Calamity mod player in the world. My drop from the treasure bag was a nebula core, which served no purpose in this version. But we also got some nebula fragments and some luminite. And that marks the end of the official chapter. Now we're going to see how far I can make it with endgame vanilla and Calamity 1.0 equipment on the latest version of Calamity. So I disabled my cheats, and I'm sure there won't be any more game breaking bugs, right? And here we're officially loaded into the challenge. What are the rules? While well, I'm playing on revengeance mode, I can't use any of the current Calamity items, which means no buffs, no permanent power-ups, and no current equipment. The only exception of course is boss spawners, and the final goal will be the Devourer of Gods. I won't bore you with the grinding involved to reach my final desired year, so let me just show you my endgame loadout that I'll mainly use for the remainder of the challenge. And let's get straight into the boss rush. Beginning with the Profane Guardians. This fight is extremely long and drawn out, so let's use this time to discuss my loadout. Solar Armor provides us with some amazing melee stats that can even compete DPS wise with gear such as Tarragon and Blood Flare. But of course, these are banned. As for weapons, I mainly use the Galactica Blade as our highest DPS option by far. Though this will change once we get to the Devourer of Gods. Just wait and see. Now I haven't really fought the newly reworked Profane Guardians in so long, and I can say that they are definitely harder than before. I love the distinct versions of each Guardian, and make it way easier to tell which is which. Your main focus, and who you want to kill first, is the healer. This can be slightly difficult for me, as the Galactica comments do not pierce, but slowly enough, we take the healer down. After that, the fight gets significantly less crazy, and I can finally breathe. In this phase, your next target is the Guardian Defender, which casts profane rocks to circle around itself and detach and launch at the player. I found this move pretty hard to see, but the damage is not nearly enough. 
and it was fairly easy to deal with. As for the final guardian, the guardian commander, this was the easiest phase. With only one boss to keep track of, all you have to do is dodge its holy blast and watch for the explosions. Pretty easy, and soon enough, that's our first post moon lord boss down. So far, Calamity 1.0 equipment can hold against the modern era, but will that change against Providence? Nah, not really. It was quite easy. But I do have to preface by saying I am super experienced with this fight. I fought the old versions of this boss, reworked versions, Infernum versions. This fight is ingrained into my head and I was easily able to first try Providence. I will add, I love the improved visuals on the border, so I actually know when I'm too far away from the boss. In phase two, the only thing you'll struggle against is either her cocoon phase, divine crystal phase, or my personal hardest part is when she calls out her guardians to aid her in battle. But you can just save your rage or adrenaline for this phase, and there shouldn't be any issues. So that's Providence slain, and it saddens me that I cannot equip the Elysian shield, my beloved dash accessory. And the next phase of the boss rush will be the Sentinels. Progression wise, these are mostly fought post Providence with stronger gear. However, in reality, these can be summoned immediately after Moon Lord and give very nice weapons for the respective classes. The difficulty, however, is not at all a challenge in comparison. Cygnus would directly run into my Galactica comments, decimating his HP bar. And with the help of Adrenaline, I was quick to melt this boss. And the same thing can be said for the Stormweaver. This is when the weakness of my loadout started to show. The previous encounters, my DPS was nowhere near as optimal as you can probably imagine. But with no piercing capabilities from my current loadout, this led to the fight being so long, with a high kill time of around 3 minutes and 45 seconds. And this was especially evident against the Ceaseless Void. Killing the Dark Plasma Balls was super hard, and on multiple attempts, I struggled quite a bit. It was even more annoying because of the warped gravity, which made dodging even more harder than before. I even tried fighting it in rage outside of the dungeon, but that was a pretty silly idea, as even though I had infinitely more space, enraged bosses are not good. And speaking of enraged, on my next attempt, I decided that maybe that the reason I was losing was because of the missing dungeon walls. So using the shimmered dungeon walls, I patched some areas, but not everything. Just enough so the biome state was all dungeon around my arena. With that, on my very next attempt, things seemed so much better. Don't get it twisted though, it was still super drawn out and challenging as the amount of flying projectiles were hard to keep track of. But slowly after some time, we managed to defeat the Ceaseless Void. And now all the Sentinels have been defeated, and it's time to fight the Devourer of Gods. This fight was definitely the most challenging of the entire run. It was super frustrating. And it doesn't help that my loadout is complete. Every class has a designated weapon for dog, which ideally consists of an absurd amount of peers. Melee users love the Terror Blade, Mage users use the Shadow Bolt Staff or Dark Spark, Summoners we don't talk about, the Disgusting class makes this game so easy, and Rogue with the Stealth Strike Wave Pounder. But the Galactica Blade, it was not going to cut it. The DPS was just too low and not viable at all. I even tried the Nuclear Fury with Nebula Armor, and that seemed pretty decent, but I still struggled a lot. And well guys, if all else fails, what class do we always go back to? It's the Summoner class, the Destroyer of Universes, the best class in any version of Calamity. The loadout I'll be using consists of the Statagel armor set, but the trade off is, one head charge will annihilate me, or one stray laser, and all my HP is gone, meaning the battle against the Devourer will be one of pure skill and dodging. So let the final challenge commence.
that's the end of the playthrough, but maybe not the end of the journey, as the dev team has recently announced another version of the Calamity Classic series, with most post Moonlord content. If you would like to see a continuation of this series of me fighting all the OG post Moonlord bosses, let me know in the comments below and I'll make a part 2. Subscribe and goodbye!